Hi everyone, slightly late, I'm still, uh, you know, um, setting up the stream with some music for the background, almost there. Okay, you should hear it now. Yes, so welcome to this session. And I should, for the end, I should just update the program for today. It's not about computing similarities. I was a bit too hopeful. Uh, we don't have the data uh, to compute similarities yet. But uh, the session of today is exactly about addressing uh, these needs for the data. How do we collect the data we need? So let me just update the stream. It's about maps of science. But it's about getting OpenAlex data. Oh, good save, and you should you should see the stream that updates on the at the bottom left corner. Maps of science. It's about getting OpenAlex data. Uh, okay, what's left to do? I think we are all set. Um, so welcome, um, I'm uh, Clément Le Valois and I try to stream every Wednesday for an hour um, on a topic involving data and, uh, and fun way and interesting ways to analyze data. Uh, the way this stream has evolved is that at the beginning I, I had a kind of uh, one topic per week but quickly it morphed into projects. So uh, each uh, Twitch session per week is used to make a small progress on a long running project. Uh, the first project I have done this way started in uh, November and finished early March. Uh, and it was about uh, coding live a plugin, a free plugin for Giphy. A plugin that is uh, super interesting and well adopted by the community, by the way, where you can explore a network uh, using text mining and not just the logic of the network. So that was done, that was pretty intense, you know, doing that live uh, for just an hour. But that was, you know, it was really, uh, how do you say, uh, rewarding because we, I've been to the end of it. The next project I've started a couple of weeks ago is about um, designing maps of science. And please look at the link I'm gonna post for resources. What are maps of science? Well, I'm gonna share one with you. But first, the link to the document where I post everything you need. So it's a Google Doc where I have a quick summary of every session I've done since the beginning. So it's a, it's a long Google Doc by now. So yeah, posting it there. Um, So maps of science, the best way is to show them, right? If you want to explain them. So I'm gonna just share with you my screen. I just type maps of science. I share the results there and I share my screen. Yeah. So when you Google uh, maps of science on Google image, that's what you get and that's pretty uh, accurate uh, from my point of view. So you, 
uh, it's super simple. What you do is you collect metadata, so data about uh, data. You collect the, some data about the way uh, uh, scientific publications uh, are, uh, you know, how they are uh, archived. So a scientific publication has a lot of metadata. Uh, it has a title, of course. You know, a, a, a journal article has a title. It has a list of authors. It has the name of the journal or conference proceeding uh, where it has been published. It has a date. It has an abstract, uh, which is a short summary of the full text publication. And more than that, you have then uh, you might have in some uh, cases uh, the university where the authors uh, are affiliated. Uh, and you, so what you can do uh, with that is uh, use this data to create these maps. So let's take another one. Like if you look at, actually no, that's not, the most canonical one would be this one by uh, Raffles and uh, Leijersdorf, Raffles, Porter and Leijersdorf. So this one here, where the, the end goal is creating an atlas of the entire scientific activity across all scientific fields, uh, from the social sciences and the humanities to uh, the physics of uh, materials and computer science. Uh, and the way you can do it is by uh, plotting on the map uh, journals, like the Journal of uh, Business Ethics and uh, Nature and uh, PLOS One. And I mean, you have, um, you have 200,000 journals. Uh, and how do you plot these journals on the map? As you see here, it's, it doesn't seem like completely random, right? It's not just a big cloud of dots. Uh, there is a kind of organization as a kind of donut shaped uh, form. Um, you're going to place on the map two journals close to each other if, you know, if they have a, 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 a if they have a, a sort of similarity, if they look alike in some sense. So I, I have to move forward with today's session. So I won't tell the history and the, the, all the different ways you can compute these similarities. I'm going to tell the one I'm, gonna, I'm working on, which is that two journals should be considered similar if at least one person has published a two papers, one in each journal. If, you know, if one author has published in the Journal of Business Ethics and Nature, well, they are not completely dissimilar, these two journals. They have something in common. So if you do that for every pair of journals, we should get a map. And there's also, you know, why do we have these maps? And that's another topic, but I should get going. And, uh, and please ask questions on the chat. If, if you really insist by asking questions on the chat, which I, I never have, actually, uh, then I would be super happy to expand on, on what you ask, you know. So, so to do these maps and compute these similarities, uh, one of the first questions that we that we encounter is how do we get this data, you know, about authors and publications and journals. So we are lucky that OpenAlex uh, is a non-for-profit organization that makes this uh, data available for free. And I, I'd like to insist it's, we are so lucky thanks to them. Uh, and they are in existence just for the last two years. So it's, you know, it's an opportunity which is new and exciting. Um, Just trying to zoom in. It's, oh yeah, no. 
Come on, it doesn't want to zoom in. Yes, it does here. Okay. Uh, so what you see is a lot of my, uh, you know, personal uh, and prof uh, or I mean, my professional projects that you see here. Uh, and Map of Science is the one we are currently interested in. And and that's the file that I have started uh, writing while doing this stream session. So this file is a long list of methods where my computer retrieves data from OpenLX. And I, 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 so if you look at the titles of these functions or methods, you know, get all journals with a page, paged with cursor, get all authors page with cursors, get all journals from all authors. So these are the different attempts I made uh, in the past weeks. And, and doing that, I realized that uh, one of the limits I was hitting is the number of calls to the Open Alex API. So I had no time to work during the week on the project, so I was thinking, what should I do now, today, with you? I think that let's spend this hour, or what's left of it, uh, just reasoning about what strategy we should have to get the data we need. So ultimately, how many authors have published in different journals, right? But in a way that doesn't oblige us to make uh, zillions of calls to the Open Alex API. So maybe I should. What I'm going to do with you is on the side, I'm going to open a kind of. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open a, a kind of. Oops. I'm going to show it to you, right? Just a second. I'm just going to open um, a Google Draw or Drawing uh, document. Can I do it here? No, of course. It's a bit boring. Maybe just a Google. Uh, okay, Google Slides should be enough. Okay, you should see it here, right? Yes. As a way to take notes. Uh, well, they need a title, strategies. Come on, so slow to react. Okay, so that's what it's about. Can you still see me? Let me check. Oh, no, you can't. So the title was this one. And I just want to use this document as a way to take notes. So OpenLX uh, has some uh, limits on the number of calls you can, uh, you can make to them. So it's maximum of 10 calls per second. Max. Uh, and another thing is, you can do just 100,000 calls per day. So, and I like to insist, I'm, I'm, you know, you could say we don't care, uh, just 100,000 calls per day, but uh, if we need a, a million calls, we're gonna just take 10 days. Uh, what I want to do with this project is I want to make it as low access as possible. I don't want to create a project which is, good, which is open source and, and free to use that would uh, need you know, a month to, to uh, replicate. Just having a call that, uh, not a call, but a step of data acquisition that takes 10 days, I think is a bit discouraging. Uh, by the way, uh, in the same logic, I will, and it's a bit of a hacker <laughs> spirit here, uh, but 
as much as I can, I, I will refuse, uh, I will, I mean, refrain from using databases, which, which sounds crazy, right? Because if you want to store the data, a database is pretty much uh, what is called for. Uh, but as much as I can, as long, or I'm going to try as much as I can uh, using text files as, as a storage uh, facility, just because if you want to replicate it, you don't have the extra step to, you know, install a database, uh, which you might or not, uh, might be or not be comfortable with. So 10 calls second per second maximum, 100 calls per day. Uh, and that's not finished in terms of... Uh, the other things that is super important to know is that you can get 200 results per call, I think. Yeah. What I mean by that is that if you want to get authors, you don't need to have one, you know, to retrieve one author per call. You can just request 200 authors per call. So, as you see, we want to make a multiplication here. Uh, either multiplication, yeah, multiplication, let's, let's, Oh, these notes are going to end up being pretty formal in the end. I'm just going to do this little thing here. So basically, in one day, you can retrieve 20 million entities. Which starts looking great, right? 20 million per day. It's pretty great. So my question is, how can we retrieve and so that's the statement we need I want to retrieve all journals and the authors that published in them can I do that within the 20 million entities limit that I have per day. And what I realized during, you know, this, let me show you again the code, you know, during this uh, uh, attempts and uh, kind of trials and experiments is that uh, well, I, I realized that I need to just uh, stop and think <laughs> about which uh, method is going to be. I, I realized that I have several methods to fetch all the journals and the authors that published in them. And I realized that these methods are vastly different in terms of the number of calls I'm going to, each of these methods is going to require. So methods and number of calls. Uh, maybe I should need, a, I'm going to try and do a table here. So again, we should, f we should, we should just maybe, I should just uh, copy that on top of the table here. We should keep in sight what is it that we tr are trying to achieve. And we are trying to achieve exactly that. We want all journals and, 
and the authors that published in them. Okay. So one way to achieve that is to loop through all journals, no surprise there, and for each of them, so do, can I have, yeah, so it's, first it's a non-starter, it's a non-starter actually, because if I have the list of journals, let me show you the OpenLX API. Actually, I like this session today where we just uh, take the time to think. Usually, I, I rush and code because, you know, in an hour you can't do much. So I like it, but today is, is, is more quiet. Where is the open Alex? There is a nice schema describing. Yes. We have a nice overview here. So what they call journals is actually sources because you don't have just journals. So if I want to go from journals to authors, as you see, it's a long, I mean, it suggests that we're going to have a long, a lot of, a lot of calls to make. So anyway, I think that if we loop through works, that's going to be easier because we're going to get both locations and authorships. Uh, the question is, we have a lot of works. So a work, again, is the general term for uh, published things. You know, uh, they, they use a the very generic name because uh, maybe it's not published, it's hosted, you know, so work is a more agnostic, well-chosen term. So if we loop through works, let me write that again. So we won't loop through all journals. As you see, I already discarded that. And for each of them, retrieve the name of the publication. And the list of authors. I think that's I think that's where I was last time. I I mean during the week I did have a look at these questions, and that's where I was in terms of conclusion. You know. Okay. Uh, so. By the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a, a name. So it's the logic of the process. So the API calls. Uh, how many how many works do we have? And that's where I can use. So I have written the code already for that. Get works count. You see that? So I'm going to run it here. And we'll see what, uh, how many works would this approach uh, need to fetch. So the code is running. It's a bit slow because it compiles whatever. Uh, okay, so, uh, so the number is, I'm going to paste it. So it just re returned the number of uh, So maybe not API calls, but uh, number of entities to retrieve. So here we need to retrieve works. 
and my code just told me that oh yes so 17 million works which which is actually uh, not a lot you know uh, you have more than 17 million articles published of course but why is it so few the reason is that let's go to the I've made I've filtered out a lot of uh, a lot of publications so I should I just considered the publications after 2015 cited at least once and only the publications that are journal articles and the reason is that I want to retrieve journals so no need to retrieve uh, um, data sets I mean maybe some journals publish data sets but they would they would have a journal article discussing them anyway I should document that so let me well maybe okay, I can just uh, remember that by heart so okay conditions let me check do you see what I'm writing no you don't conditions journal articles cited at least once and published after 2015 there is there are no uh, you know there are no universal reasons why I would choose these parameters it's just out of convenience to reduce the number of works while uh, serving the you know the goal of um, of you know uh, uh, getting the journals and the authors so the, the basically I I want to have a recent map so I don't need to know that two authors have uh, that one author has published in two journals in the 90s uh, because that would give me a view of the map of science in the 90s and I want at least for this first run I want to create a map of uh, a recent map okay so the works are 17 million given these conditions so it's below the 20 million uh, limit per day so I'm, I'm good so now the question is and let's look at the API can I retrieve for a given work do I you know so uh, yeah uh, I had a doubt at some point uh, when I fetch this list of works is each work giving me the journal where it's published and the authors that have you know authored the work so uh, I, I suppose yes right um, not that so work 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 is there let's look at the work object let's zoom in for your convenience So for each work come a list of authorship objects and an authorship is a, a list of authors. Uh, so that's what I thought is great, right? We're going to have a list of authors that uh, have authored the work so we could actually we, we're super good uh, we have a limit which is this one you know in uh, physics in particular but in other scientific domains uh, you can have several hundred 
uh, authors per publication because they just list, you know, they just list uh, all the employees uh, from the CERN or something. So we should be aware that using this method, we're gonna just fetch the first 100 authors of a publication, which is gonna be super fine for most domains, but it's gonna introduce is going to introduce uh, some biases. I suppose they, are, they have no effect, but there is a, a disturbance in the force uh, for physics. So we should be aware of that. If we ever see something fishy happening in our maps around physics, then we should remember that this thing might be impacting the results. Uh, okay, let's go back. Oh, I should give this oh, strategies. Okay, fine. Uh, method and number of calls. Number of entities to retrieve. So, number of calls. So the number of calls is that divided by 200 so as you see we are comfortably comfortably below the 100,000 uh, limit Uh, so if we do that, how many calls does it make per second? So just checking. So if we do that, uh, we're going to have minutes. So if we, no, I'm, I'm stupid. If we do that, so if we do 10, 10 calls per second and we, and we have 60 seconds per minute, we can do 600 calls per minute. So how many, how many minutes? It's a bit more than two hours. So I'm gonna do a slightly more realistic. So 60 seconds times not exactly 10 calls per second because uh, because you have some uh, uh, you know some uh, uh, delays and so maybe just eight calls. Well, right three hours. So that's really fantastic. Okay, then, great. Uh, and we are not even finished, so I suppose, okay, don't, 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 don't rush. Oh yes, what I wanted to do is, because I'm greedy, I'm super greedy for the ether. We are not exactly at the 100,000 calls per, per day, we are at, 86,000. So maybe that if I change slightly, I can relax the filters. Maybe that if I take all the works, but not from, not after 2014, but like, like just the year before, maybe we're gonna be still below. So I'm running it. Yeah, right below. 100 and, oh no, 19,000, 19 million uh, 
publications. So if you divide that by if you divide that by 200, I'm like at 89,000. I'm really <laughs> okay. So we are below the 100,000 calls. I have even like 2,000 calls in spare. So let's 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 do it. Uh, has anyone any objection or remark on that? Let me check there is any. I won't, I, I'm too afraid to check on, uh, on Twitch to see if there is anyone connected. Uh, I'm going to despair if there is none. Uh, so let's say I'm, I'm doing that for the YouTube replay. Uh, so, so I should stay calm. Um, okay, so let's use this approach that I have just described. We have just made sure that uh, it's within the 100,000 calls per day. And did I already write this approach? I thought so. Did I? Yeah, I didn't. I definitely didn't. Uh, well, let me do it. So it's a page cursor approach. So the page cursor is sounds really complicated, but it just means that you call, I want all the works that OpenAlex has. And of course, OpenAlex do, doesn't return all of them at once. It returns pages per page, page per page. So yeah, I had written this method, like get all authors page with cursor. Actually, no, I want all works. So I'm going to copy this one. And I'm going to paste it at the bottom. I know I should write a class for that uh, in good Java uh, fashion, but laziness is in order here. So get all works, page with cursor, and so total count works, which is, by the way, how much do I have it? Yeah, it's the one I, I just had from here. Oh, I don't need it actually. Uh, I don't need it. Because when you do a page cursor search, uh, basically, basically the, the, your code is going to loop, it's going to make a call and a call and a call and a call until the OpenAlex API returns and says, there is no more works and your code just stops. So you don't have to know in advance how many works there are. So I know why. Yeah, this number of pages, we don't really care. So that's all these things is, all these things are just useless. Nice, cleaner code. Yeah, all these things, All this thing is useless. Why did I use that? Oh yeah, because I well I was just so while it's while the cursor is not null. So while as long as is you prefer as long as the next page, you know, each page page has an ID or cursor. 
as long as the OpenAlex uh, API returns the call and says, there is, this is the ID of the next page, as long as this ID is given to me, I know there is a next page. But for the last page, OpenAlex is going to say, the cursor of the next page is null, like is not existing, because there is no next page. So that's why I can write this thing like, as long as the cursor is not null, do another call. But as soon as the cursor is going to switch to null, uh, this while loop is going to uh, stop and, and the code is going to move on to uh, what is written after this loop. So the filter should be exactly the one. So it's not orchid true and cited by, no, it's like the filters is about, <coughs> sorry. The filter is exactly this one here. Okay, so what do we want? Data, when do we want it? Now, no, not exactly. Uh, we want, what do we want to retrieve from the, so we want to retrieve also ships, right? Again, because the OpenAlex API gives you the, this great, uh, uh, opportunity to not retrieve everything from works but only the fields that you are interested in and in, in this case I am interested in authorships and what was the other thing Yes, I think, oh, either I want locations. So locations is this weird thing, but we had seen it together there. Let me show you here. That's quite interesting because some work is, any work is from a source, you know, it has been published in a journal or hosted in a repository. But actually a work can be in many locations, in different repos. So if you take a journal, of course it appears in, I'm oh sorry, if you take an article, of course it appears in the journal where it was published, right? An article has been published in a journal, but the same article can be available in a, in a public repository. Uh, it can be available uh, yeah, like on the ResearchGate or HAL in France or uh, Archive, uh, you know, the famous uh, repository for, uh, for physics, engineering and, and computer science. So that's why in the works they suggest that we can retrieve locations. The only thing is that location is a bit yeah, and that's super nice. We just want the primary location. Like, even if a, an article can be published in uh, many places by what is really of interest of, to us, who want because we want to do a maps of journal, a map of journals, we want to get the journal where the article is published. We don't really care that it was also published uh, uh, elsewhere, right? And thankfully, the API gives us the primary location, and if you read the fine prints, the primary location is where you can find the best copy of this work for peer-reviewed journal article, exactly our use case. This would be a full text published version hosted by the publisher at the article's, uh, you know, DOI. So the, basically the, in the journal, 
where it was published. So we good with that. Let's make sure that yeah we have the ID. We're gonna collect the ID of the. Oh, you don't see it. It's right below. Yeah, we're gonna have the ID of this primary location. That's the name of our. Oh, and we have the display name. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, great. All in one call. So primary location. And that's it, I suppose. Right? We can ditch all the rest. Uh, so if you are interested in the code, it's super simple. So we do a first call, right? Give us, and at the beginning, you don't have a cursor. You don't know the name of the page that you want to fetch. So the default value is this asterisk, you know, is a star sign, which is like first page. So give me the first 200, not authors, works. Give me the two first 100 works that were pub among the works that were published after 2014 that were cited at least once and that are journal articles. And in the response, don't give me the full works uh, description. I just want the place where authorships are described and where the primary location is described. Uh, so yes, I want 200 uh, works at a time, and that's it. So that's what I want. This line is actually, uh, well, this line is, I mean, it's super long. I could just write it in one, in one line. So build the request which is a fancy way in this, I mean, this request is super simple in this case, so there is nothing much information, nothing, there's no new information there. And this is where my code is actually gonna send the call over the internet to OpenAlex. So this line, I, I could just show it here. This is the line that does the magic. You send the request and so the request is sent there, like this is the part of the line that sends the request, and the response is stored on the left of the equal sign, the response. So hopefully, you know, if the response is successful, it comes with a status code that is 200, it's a convention for over the, over the web, and Otherwise, if the response status code is not 200, then, then uh, you know, uh, Houston, we have a problem. And I just say we have a problem. So anyway, in the case when the response is correct and successful, I retrieve the answer that OpenAlex has sent me. I turn this answer into a JSON object, and JSON is simply you know, these are the, you know, this way to show the data with curly brackets and stuff. This is the JSON uh, uh, data format. So um, in, in Java, you, you have you have to instruct, you know, to uh, for your program to take into account these curly brackets and data structure. <clears throat> in this data structure, what I want to retrieve is first of all the cursor for the next page because that's the cursor I'm going to use for my next call. So that's what you see here. And then I want the results, you know, the 200 uh, uh, works. So it's in the results uh, section. And get the result and add them to a queue. Oh, the queue. Oh, I might have an out of memory. I'm going to definitely have an out of memory issue here. Oh, good to. Out of memory means that depending on the on which computer I run that, but computers don't have infinite memory. So if I just store in memory uh, my my results, 
at some point the computer will say will say no it, it's going to say i don't have memory left and the thing is going to crash so I mean, I'm thinking because there is a boring but uh, important step where, you know, I should have two things in parallel. I should have the these calls running and getting the works, and in parallel, I should have another bit of a program that takes the results as they come, and when the results are kind of voluminous, you know, the calls continue on, on one side, but the other part of the program takes the results and writes them to a file to empty the queue. And that's always something boring to write. So in this case, ChatGPT can help. So let's use ChatGPT for that. ChatGPT. Uh, <clears throat> And I have eight minutes left if I want to stay under the hour. Okay, so uh, in Java, which version of Java do I use? If I use a very recent version, let's 19, that's nice. So I'm asking, ChatGPT in Java 19. I have a, a loop making API calls fetching JSON results. JSON uh, host calls fetching JSON objects which are stored in a, where do, I, where do I store my results? In a queue, in a concurrent linked queue. Wow, fancy. I would like to have this concurrent in queue emptied, emptied at regular intervals to avoid an out of memory exception. The queue sh should empty by <coughs> writing the JSON objects into a, f uh, not writing, into, uh, by appending, by append writing. So writing, not erasing the content of the file, but uh, appending the new results at the end of it into a file using, let's using the, and, and you know, the newest uh, Java API for Java file the NEO API, can you show me? <clears throat> well, you don't see what I see. That's a pity because that was super impressive. Let me, uh, let me do it for you again because that was mind-blowing. So let me just hide it for a second. Uh, okay, ready to see? 
Okay, so I made this question to to ChatGPT, and it just gives me. So I'm not sure it's going to be a a perfect result, but at least it's going to be pretty. Uh, Oh, so the, by the way, it's not emptying, it's flushing the correct term. File channel, I didn't know this API. Okay, great. Okay, that's, uh, so that's what I was thinking. It creates a runnable. Yeah, and that's what I hated doing myself. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Thank you for writing this very boring. Uh, so I'm going to write. Uh, uh, I'm not going to write. I'm going to. I'm just copy pasting. So I'm going to create a JSON Q processor class. And even the name is pretty rad. JSON Q processor. So you know this in this file that you're gonna see on the let me show you. So as you see, I've created the second file next to the one where I work, which is empty at the moment, JSON Q processor. <coughs> and in this file, I'm just 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 gonna copy paste what, what ChatGPT has written. I, I, had, I had seen, so author Clément Levalois, uh, not really. So author ChatGPT and Clément Levalois. Hopefully I'm going to have some input there. So what does it do? So the interval should not be five minutes. I'm a bit afraid it will already. It's going to be one minute. Yeah, one minute is is already a lot of data. Uh, one minute should be fine. So file channel. I ha I didn't know what a file channel is. Uh, I'm going to ask ChatGPT. By the way, that's. Uh, well, before asking it, I should finish uh, finish what I'm doing. <coughs> so, create, write, append. Okay. While true, so you know, do that without stopping ever. The only thing is that I should be able to stop this thing. So, aha, I have an input. So, <laughs> the machine is not the only one to do stuff here. So, while, uh, while um, you know, while program or while, uh, while, uh, AP calls while the API calls are running. So that's a Boolean variable, a yes, no, a true, false, sorry, variable. And it's uh, true by default. While the API is running, do all of that, but we should be able to send stop <coughs> stop uh, stop to stop this thing. We're gonna just set API call running to false. And when we're gonna do that, <coughs> it's gonna stop that. Okay. 
Okay, it's not super elegant this thing, but I can understand. So should it sleep for a hundred milliseconds or it's stupid because, uh, you know, if the thing is, if the flush interval is Wow, what this thing? False true. There is something not clear here. So you run. Does it use a byte buffer? It's like super complex. Ah, oh, I think I get it. That's super complex for. Okay, maybe it's super efficient, but that's super complex for something that could be super simple. Never mind. Are we gonna? give it a try in any case. Okay, so this thing is going to flush the queue and and it should be called uh, with that. And then it should be launched with that. It's really simple. So where is the queue? It's there. And this is where we launch. So the f let's remove that. We don't need that anymore. So it's all works txt. Jason, by the way. We don't need that. <coughs> oh, yeah, it should be a path. Path of. All good. Why does it complain? Oh, yeah. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. I see. here. Oh, it wants a string. No, 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 not a string. Uh, 
Oh yeah, okay, I see that. Uh, oof. Okay, let's make it a string then. To string. I think we should have an array of we're gonna do something like that. Yeah, something like that. We should introduce commas between the JSON objects because if we want to read them as an array, they should be comma separated. Uh, I hope. For the test, I'm going to stop it when the courage page indexed equals one. Okay, so making a test here. We are past 4 p.m., but I'm a bit curious, you know, how is it going to play out? Okay, c'est parti. So I run it. Uh, yeah, I run it. And we'll see. So let me open the file where this thing should. Uh, it's not, it's going to break, I mean, for sure. But we can dream. Okay, so first thing, it doesn't stop, right? The program has stopped, but the, the, the program in this, like the method has finished, it has returned, but it has not stopped the, the JSON queue processor has not stopped. Oh, because I didn't call it to finish. Uh, normal, so it's, it's as expected, so I should stop it when it's finished. So let's let's redo it again. <clears throat> I should stop it here. Oh, by the way, can I stop it? No. How do I stop this thing? Because I have a JSON Q processor. processor. Ah, okay. Sorry, it's Q processor. processor. Stop. 
I'm not saying it's the correct way to do things, but let's try it again. <coughs> Mm, the shred still doesn't stop. I don't know how to stop a shred. Should be quite simple. Let's try it again. Join means wait for this shred to terminate. No, I don't want it to terminate. I want to terminate it myself. Interrupt. That's here. Interrupt this thread. Perfect. So let's run it again. And now the program finishes cleanly. So let's look at the, so this is where the file has been uh, written, all works.json. Oh, it's like, okay, it's a big file. And the reason is that, uh, well, it gets a lot of, oh, something is hanging here. Oh, the file is gonna be, the file is gonna be gigantic. Yeah, the file is going to be... <laughs> oh, the file is going to be huge. 17 million works plus all the authors. That's going to be... That's going to be... Well, on a server, I, I have gigabytes of... I hope that's fine, but uh, let's have a look at this file. How does it look like? I mean, if I have 67 megabytes in just one second, I mean, how big is it going to be? So I'm going to edit it in Vim, which is uh, less memory. Uh, come on, Vim. My computer is struggling here, I don't know why. So Vim is like a text editor, but it's really made to open very large. Oh, charming. Charming. <laughs> okay, so I suggest we look at that uh, next week. Uh, the, the f everything works except for this, obviously for this uh, writing phase where it has written null uh, like crazy. So I'm just deleting this file. And what we're gonna do next week is uh, look at the Q processor because, or maybe I could do it now because it's really stupid. I just take the JSON and write it, right? And don't do this silly fine channel stuff. Okay, I'm gonna do it now because it's like super simple. Oh, but JSON is never null. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, that's a mistake I made here. Oh, that's why it was writing null. Oh, yeah, it's because I just because of that. Actually, it's not. Maybe it's actually uh, the whole thing by. GPT, I suppose, was working great. It's just that I introduced a mistake with that. Because by adding a comma, actually, JSON was never null. So it was it was writing, you know, null comma, null comma, 
for many times per second, 10 times per second. Okay, we should be fine now. And I can start again. So yes, I want to remove this file. This is where the thing is going to appear. Okay, let's launch it again. Run. Okay, the file was much too big. It's nothing to do with the data. It's just my, my the bug I introduced. So launching again. It's finished. We can look at the file. Huh. Much bigger. What's the what's the deal here? My god. Made another, I must have made another mistake. What's the issue here? Look at the size of this file. It's like humongous. Like almost 600 megabytes. How is it even possible? And I like to open that with Vim. Why is it taking so long to just open the contextual menu? So Vim has finally opened. I want to look at the content of the file. Why 600 megabytes written in, uh, in, uh, in 10 seconds? Okay, Vim is hanging. And Vim is not supposed to hang. It can open files that are gigabytes large, so 600 megabytes is nothing. And still I see no, see nothing in the content. Where did I make a mistake? Vim, no, still nothing. Okay, and I'm gonna drop it. Okay, that's to be seen for later. I've, I must quit now. Um, I just want to flush this queue. Uh, just want to flush this queue uh, once in a while so that it doesn't uh, overflow the memory. 
but it's a bit more complicated than it seems. So I'm going to do that uh, another time. Thanks for following. Uh, as you see, it's like a, a long process. Uh, we're going to continue next time and uh, hopefully we're going to be out, out of the woods soon so that we can concentrate on working on the data instead of uh, spending our time, uh, you know, fetching the data. Uh, but that's for, yeah, that's for next week. See you then. Thank you. I'm going to post it on uh, YouTube as a replay.